Welcome to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Apologies for the delay in getting started this morning. It took us a few extra minutes to get connected to the YouTube feed. Uh, we are coming back to our deliberations on S25, an act relating to miscellaneous cannabis uh, regulation procedures. Um, we've already had a good walk through with the bill and spent some time with the incoming chair of the Cannabis Control Board uh, and some other folks testifying this morning. And uh, with us right now, we have David Shearer, who's the Assistant Attorney General. Um, and I, I believe that primarily David will be talking with us about um, the sections of S25 dealing with uh, advertising, uh, because as folks will recall from the testimony yesterday from the incoming chair of the Cannabis Control Board, um, there is uh, a, a vacuum at the moment in terms of what the advertising policy will be. And uh, so David Shear, thank you for being with us and um, welcome. Please, please share with us the perspective of the Attorney General's office with respect to the advertising language in S25. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And for the record, David Shear, Assistant Attorney General. Um, we, our office is in support of the advertising sections uh, to, to put the headline up front here. I'll limit my remarks today to the sections that are related to advertising, which I believe are five through nine, although the really substantive meaty ones that uh, have the biggest legal impact and potentially concern that are most likely to be litigated, I think are sections six and nine, and they are substantially the same with regard to cannabis establishments and, um, and dispensaries in section nine. So the constitutional issue, and, I, and let me also back up and say, sometimes I appear as sort of a policy person, and today I'm appearing more as like a legal advisor person to talk about the constitutional issues and happy to answer questions that may arise from that. Um, and there are other folks in my office who are more expert than I am, including our Solicitor General, who I have consulted on some of these issues to make sure I'm up to speed in testimony here today. Um, we're talking here about a constitutional issue whenever the government seeks to regulate speech. And there are different levels of scrutiny depending on the speech that's being regulated and the the type of the speech, the way the regulations happen, there's a bunch of different considerations. For this type of regulation, we are talking about commercial speech because we're trying to regulate speech related to uh, commercial enterprises and, and specifically advertising of commercial enterprises. And there is established case law that governs how we look at these things. And there is um, both the sort of broad case law that would be applicable, a federal case law that would be applicable to this, and also a couple of specific cases that deal with the nuance respecting cannabis advertising in particular. And I'm actually going to put a pin in those and return to them at the end of my testimony, because I think that'll be a clearer way to go through it. But uh, hopefully what I say will be helpful to you. And obviously, feel free to ask any questions. The key federal case that we look to when we're trying to figure out if a proposed regulation is likely to be upheld by a court or struck down is called Central Hudson, Central Hudson Gas and Electric versus the Public Service Commission. It's a case from 1980, but it is still good law and still governs how the courts look at whether or not regulations of commercial speech are in fact lawful. And that case laid out a four-prong test, and I'll just run through that now. Uh, the first prong is that the speech must, uh, in order for um, commercial speech to receive free speech protection, in other words, to have it be unlawful for the, go for the government to regulate it, um, it must, first of all, concern lawful activity and not be misleading. So if it falls outside of that, then it's not really protected by the First Amendment at all, and government can deal with it however it would like to. There's no real limitation in that case. Uh, once you pass that bar, you are now in the realm of speech that does get First Amendment prote protection. And there are three more bars that need to be met. Um, the government interest needs to be substantial in order for the regulation to pass muster. Uh, the regulation needs to directly advance the governmental interest that is being asserted. 
And finally, the regulation must not be more extensive than is necessary to serve that governmental interest. And so when we go through the potential regulations here, kind of look at them, uh, look, you know, we, what we what we did in our office is we looked at them one by one and I'll sort of make a few general statements about it. But if people have specific questions about specific prongs, I'm happy to do that, uh, go into more specific um, issues on those prongs. But generally speaking, you know, we think that we st would stand on fairly solid ground defending these prongs under the central, central Hudson test. You know, we're talking about regulation of a substance where there is valid medical concern about uh, consumption and potential harm that can result, especially to young people. Um, and it is, uh, you know, that's sort of like a piece where you'd present evidence from the health department, from studies, from public health authorities showing that there are reasons why um, you wouldn't want this to be sold in the way that, you know, a fire truck for a kid might be sold. It's clearly a different category of product than that. Um, so we do think that meeting prong, the, the basic prong of is the government interest substantial? We think yes. And for some of these potential regulations, we think there's an even stronger one than that. When you're talking about young people under 21, there's very good science and very solid data showing that there is per, a higher potential for harm for young people who consume it. And um, again, that science is, is quite solid. And um, so I think for that, we have a governmental interest that's even more, so, so we'd be on even more solid ground. We do think that looking down through these potential regulations that the they are, there is a decent argument and a strong argument even in each of them to say that the regulations are directly advancing the governmental interest asserted. Uh, for example, you're talking about say, let's pick number six on this would be, uh, I'm looking right now on page 15 of S25 as passed by the Senate. Um, it says depicts a person under 21 years of age consuming cannabis or cannabis products. So that's one of the things that they're not allowed to do. And clearly that falls within the concern around young people uh, consuming uh, cannabis. And it very directly advances that governmental interest. So then you go to the final piece of the puzzle here and you say, well, is that regulation more extensive than necessary to serve that interest? And we would argue and we think we would be on secure ground arguing that no, that is um, not more extensive than is necessary. Uh, again, in general, this is a product that is not allowed to be sold to those under 21. And even, you know, even under this uh, incoming legal scheme. And given that this is narrow, not narrow, I don't want to use the term narrowly tailored because that's actually a term in a different test that we legal test that gets used that is not applicable to this one, but it is uh, sufficiently focused on the uh, potential harm that we're trying to prevent. And for that reason, we think it would pass the fourth prong as well. So that's an example of the analysis we did for each of the prongs. And we think that they all um, are going to, we at least feel that we are on secure ground going into court. One of the things that's tough about uh, being a lawyer sometimes, and, and you think even more frustrating for those receiving legal advice, is that we can't give guarantees on cases that have not been decided yet. Uh, but we do think that we're on secure legal ground uh, making a case for this. I want to return to that other piece that I talked about, the cannabis specific um, landscape that this is happening on, which is, and, and there is a little wrinkle here, which is that there are, we have a couple court opinions, as far as I know, only two, uh, one from Montana, one from Washington state, addressing the question of whether or not uh, cannabis gets first amendment protection at all uh, because it is unlawful under a federal scheme. Montana said, well, no, you don't. This was actually Mon not Montana's. Um, uh, they don't, they're not a retail market. This was the medical dispensary system set up in Montana. And they said, no, advertising, there's, there's no First Amendment protection here at all. Government can do whatever they want to regulate uh, because it's unlawful under the federal scheme. Washington State Court went the other way and said, actually, 
this is lawful in the state of Washington. And therefore, uh, First Amendment issues apply and we are going to uh, um, apply that scrutiny. And they did in fact strike down a particular aspect of the signage regulations that existed in Washington state at the time. So that's a sort of baseline question that has to be met. And we, you know, th there's not a lot of cases to go on to know what would happen. We do think that it is certainly an odd position. It's one that we could try to take, but it would be an odd position to go into court and say that, well, the state of Vermont has decided that this is lawful, but we are arguing that it doesn't get first amendment because a different jurisdiction, the federal jurisdiction says it's unlawful. Um, and the other reason why we support this approach going forward is that thinking about it, the sort of combination of public policy risk and litigation risk. If you, if you have a complete uh, free hand to regulate. In other words, maybe a ban, say, would be an extreme version of that. But say there's no parameters, Vermont places no parameters around what the regulations can be, and the board goes off and it introduces some very significant regulations that may be tough to defend on First Amendment grounds. Um, let's say that that gets struck down, that the sort of legal scheme, the statutory scheme gets struck down, just uh, permitting any, you know, permitting any regulation or, or saying that there's a total ban. Once that gets struck down by the courts, uh, there's nothing left. The state of Vermont has no legal authority to regulate anything. It's a, so let's say it's a ban. So ban is deemed unlawful and now it's a free for all and there's no statute left in place to, um, regulate and people running establishments would be able to do whatever they want, at least until the legislature stepped back in to try to fix the situation. But that could be many months as, as you as you well know, if a court opinion came out in late June, got a ways to go before uh, the legislature can come back and try to fix that. Whereas if you have something like this and you have specifically enumerated uh, types of expression that are being prohibited and one of those prongs fails or maybe even two of them fail in a court challenge, the other ones still remain. And so Vermont is still left with some protection, uh, which I think is the intent of the legislature. We certainly think that's a very reasonable and appropriate intent. And that is a safer litigation stance to approach this from where, all right, maybe one or two of these doesn't withstand scrutiny, but on the whole, um, you know, just because those fail, we still have a system in place to appropriately regulate. Um, so that's where we are coming from on this. We support it. We think it's a reasonable way forward. And we think we're on fairly solid ground defending these. And for the intertwined public policy and litigation stance issue that I just talked about, we think that this is really a fairly safe way to move forward as well. Thank you. Um, I have a few members with questions. So Rip Behovsky. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. One, if for some reason, and it doesn't sound like we would, but I'm curious if, if Vermont went the way of Montana and then cannabis was legalized federally, would that force to us to look at that again, given that that law had changed? I mean, I think that we are on safe ground. What, what our argument would be is that we're on safe ground, even if we assume that the First Amendment applies. Okay. So if it gets legalized federally, then definitely the First Amendment applies. That question's removed entirely from the equation. But we're saying that even if a court in Vermont were to decide that it does apply here, we're safe now and certainly under the, or we're on a good, we have a, we have a solid argument to bring to court. And certainly if that changes, we still have a solid argument to bring to court. We're in the same position we are now. Awesome, thank you. My other question is also a little bit hypothetical, but if corporations and businesses were not deemed people, would they still be protected by the First Amendment? Commercial, yeah, the, the commercial speech test is not, that question about whether corporations are people or not is not relevant to the question about whether commercial speech is regulated or not. Commercial speech is regulated under the central Hudson test regardless of how you legally categorize whoever it is that's doing the advertising. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam <clears throat> Chair. <clears throat> Are any of the lessons that you have uh, 
incorporated into your discussion arisen from state constitutional uh, decisions or are they all uh, interpretations of uh, the, the, uh, uh, the case law at the federal level? So the Washington case did incorporate both the in its decision, it said it was basing its decision both on the both on the federal constitution and on Washington state constitution. But my understanding, and I, I will check this, but I'm fairly confident in saying my understanding is that often, as the Vermont Supreme Court often does as well, they basically said the Washington Constitution has the same level of protection as the federal constitution. So the analysis is the same in both cases. So it didn't really substantively change the inquiry. They but they did base it on both the. Um, federal and Washington Constitution. Uh, thank you. To uh, follow up, uh, though it may not help because there's not a lot of case law, uh, Vermont has diverged from the federal, uh, particularly in the areas of personal freedoms. So that's that's unplowed territory. Uh, I guess the other, excuse me. I was just going to say that's certainly true. I didn't mean to yeah. indicate otherwise, especially in Fourth Amendment. Um, yeah criminal defense related issues, the Vermont is more protective. Um, I don't think we've uh, done a, any commercial speech case that I'm aware of where Vermont has gone differently, but your point broadly is well taken. Uh, the, the second uh, issue that came up, I, you know, like many of us who are holdovers, so to say, we dealt with the, uh, the should we ban or should we uh, put a tight set of reins on it? Uh, this last biennium debate, um, and obviously deferred to the judgment that on uh, your boss's advice would keep us out of court, or at least give us a good shot at prevailing. Um, I'm wondering, because I think there's a, a, a reasonable basis in, in uh, precedent to distinguish between the levels of scrutiny or the levels of reining in as between the age of the likely uh, observer recipient of the ads. I'm wondering if you think that there's any way to go tighter uh, on the um, current language where it's likely that a person under 21 years of, old, uh, of age uh, would actually be uh, even uh, on a chance uh, able to see the advertisement, uh, understanding that because it's illegal under 21, in Vermont, I, I assume from your discussion, and I, I trust that, that we're uh, there are latitude to to be uh, very uh, parsimonious uh, about the latitudes uh, is different for under twenty one, and I guess where I'm going is is there any way to tighten that language, um, and say you uh, may not do this, this, and this because it's um, possible, not likely, possible that a person under 21 would be exposed to it. Right. No, it's a, it's a very good question. And I'm not sure I could give you a specific, um, you know, I assume you're talking about the piece where it says that it, a licensee can sh has to show that not more than 15% of the audience is reasonably expected to see the advertisement. And I think would, that, yeah, I, I think that's pretty permissive, 50%. I, I, yeah, I think it's one five of um, 15 percent. Yeah. Um, you know, that's one of those things where it's really hard to say that X percent is going to be the thing that the court says is too restrictive. I, I do think that at a certain point of restrictiveness, you're going to run into prongs three and four, and especially four, which says whether the regulation, the court has to ask whether the regulation is not more extensive than is necessary to serve that interest. It may be that a court will say, yeah, completely um, banning the possibility that anybody under 21, you know, we'll, we'll, we're gonna, because under 21 is a, already a legally separate category with respect to this product, we're gonna say that um, that is fine and it's not more extensive than is necessary. But the tighter and tighter you make it, the more likely you are to raise a court's concern that you've gone too tight and that it is more extensive than necessary. Again, I can't sit here and say that the X percent is going to be the point at which they say that's too much. We just don't know. Um, it may be that 
they say a complete ban under 21 is fine. It may be that they say that, well, because that effectively means that you're banning virtually any type of advertising, because it'd be very, I think as a practical matter, it'd be very hard for an advertiser to show that an advertisement would never reach the eyeballs of somebody under 21. A court may say that, well, at that point, because you've effectively banned it entirely, um, that is too far. It is more extensive than is necessary. And you fail the central Hudson test for that reason. Um, so my guess is, and this is a bit of a guess, is that a complete saying no possibility that our new 21 can see it, if that were the regulation, I think that would be harder to defend under the central Hudson test. Uh, and it would be more likely to be overturned. Some sort of percentage where, okay, you really have to show that this is primarily directed to adults. Uh, you know, if there's some slippage there because you can't, it'd be extremely difficult to guarantee, you know, under 21 eyeballs, see it. Um, you know, some leeway there built in makes it okay and there and uh, meets the final prong because it doesn't become effectively an absolute ban. So I think where you've landed is again, one that we feel like is defensible on the reasoning that I just spoke about. I think being more restrictive, you are definitely entering into tougher territory to defend. I think more likely a court would have a problem with it. Thank you. I just, uh, it's unfortunate from my point of view uh, that the uh, a numerical quota or formula is included for the instruction reasons that the judicial branch generally uses terms of art like preponderance and clear and convention convincing rather than mathematical apparatus. And so for my money, it would be much better to use a word like unlikely or uh, rarely or uh, possible uh, rather than fooling around with 50% because uh, that's just a tripwire. I actually, you know, that it's a fair point. It isn't usually courts often do make decisions on the basis of likelihoods and so forth. Um, the other state that does have, um, and, and I should also say at the same time, courts have to be able to uh, take into account uh, more precise sort of mathematical issues that does happen sometimes. So I, I think the point is well taken. I think that um, the, this is based on a concept that came out of Colorado where they do also have a percentage that is a, a specific percentage in their regulations. That actually has not been challenged in court at all. Um, and that's one interesting test case, I think, for Vermont in terms of the practical outcome of how this has played out, not so much in the courtroom um, litigation. But um, it just hasn't been challenged early on in courts, in, sorry, in Colorado's um, statutory scheme as it came into play. There was a challenge from uh, a, a set of media organizations who were uh, basically saying, we're going to lose a bunch of revenue because this is such a restrictive um, uh, regulation. And the federal court said, I believe, it was, I believe it was a federal court case, basically said, you don't have standing because you are not the ones who are being directly regulated. So that's not a sufficient interest in and then nobody who was being directly regulated has ever brought a challenge in Colorado. And I think that um, effectively what's happened is that the various establishments feel that they are able to have commercially viable enterprises under the regulations and have felt that a challenge is gonna be not necessarily productive. And so it just hasn't happened, even though it's a very robust uh, market there with a lot of people involved in it. So. Just a note about how things have played out elsewhere. We obviously can't be certain how they, whether that would play out similarly here. Uh, thanks, David. I think um, I think it's worth just noting that when we uh, when House Government Operations crafted this restrictive language around advertising in the last biennium. Uh, we were trying to be as um, as careful as we could be to make sure that uh, that we were crafting an advertising um, regime that would keep cannabis advertising out out of view of uh, people who are underage and and for whom cannabis use is not legal. Um, and so our 
our 15 percent that we uh, that we put in in our initial language is uh, is a bit stricter than other states than Colorado and California who are um, at 70 and 30, but but we felt that 15 percent was uh, you know the right. Uh, the right way to say we want to be sure cannabis control board as you're uh, as you're uh, regulating advertising we want to be sure that this isn't um, you know promoting use among underage Vermont youth um, so anyway just a little bit of context um, I have representative Hooper with a question uh, thank you madam chair hey David um, my questions were really along the lines of Representative Anthony's. I think that this 15% number all of a sudden dictates where you can do business more than how you do business to some degree. You can't, you're very limited as far as where you set up in a shopping center or something like that. Um, that's sort of a weird backdoor way of getting to it. I would have preferred no, but this really restricted things. Secondly, though, the first prong of your central Hudson, does that effectively say you can appeal this state court jurisdiction only? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we're going to have to see how it plays out as to the extent that litigation develops in this area. And again, it is interesting to me that it actually hasn't really developed in other states, mostly establishments have just been willing to accept regulations and, and, and move forward with them. But I, I that, that's going to be one of the fundamental questions is whether or not um, the fact that it is unlawful on a federal level is going to dictate uh, how courts treat the First Amendment question. And uh, we, we don't know the answer to that right now. Again, we're, we're working on minimal, min not not zero, but, but very little precedent. Uh, but we do you think that the Washington precedent is uh, one that could, and that was a state court decision that decided that um, the federal um, legal regime applied and the, the federal case law applied. So I, I, we do think that that is a, a very possible outcome here if a court were to look at this too and say, you, the state of Vermont, you're a state jurisdiction, but you decided it's lawful. And so once you decided it's lawful, all of the First Amendment protections that apply to speech will apply to this too. You, you see a federal court saying, even though this is, even though bank robbery is illegal, I'm gonna allow you to advertise that you're a bank robber. That's sort of the threshold that we're getting to. Is that- Well, the bank robbery is certainly illegal under state well, law as well. Uh, <laughs> you need a, an analogy that, you know, has the same distinction that we're creating with cannabis. Um, and I can try to think of one, but I don't have it right off the top of my head. It's usury. That's pretty common. But OK, thanks. Anyway, moving on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Gannon. Thank you. Um, thank you, David, for testifying this morning. Um, so as I understand it, um, the, the benefit of, of what the Senate um, proposes in S-25 is that if, if part of this is struck down, we still would have certain restrictions on advertising. Whereas an outright ban, if it gets struck down, then we basically have the wild west of cannabis advertising until the legislature can stand up a new advertising regime. Is that? That's, yeah, that's concisely stated, exactly, right, yeah. So, I mean, for example, I mean, if the 15% the um, park get struck down, we would still have the language in B um, about depicting children um, using cannabis. So, I mean, there would still be some protections in place um, that, that could be very beneficial because I, I think the part that's, that, that if something was likely to get struck down, it would probably be subsection C. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's good advice because at least we would have some advertising protections in place that's, and, and yes, that's, committee, yeah. go ahead i was just gonna say that, that that is right that is one of the major advantages to doing it this way yeah and, and for committee members remember um with respect to the the 15 restriction um that has to be shown by the cannabis establishment and, and one of the good things about having a, a percentage number is it makes it very easy for the cannabis control board which is responsible for reviewing advertisements 
to determine whether or not that threshold has been met. If we have something like, you know, some language like is likely to be, then you could have arguments that would go to court about whether it was likely to, to be seen by, by children. Is, is that true, David? Do you think there's more of a concern there? I've, I think that this, that particular piece about how, whether or not you can show it, um, you know, make it clear showing, I, I think that it's reasonable to use, I mean, again, we did discuss this. I think it is reasonable to use a percentage to say like, this is what your audience is gonna be. In some cases, like there's real data that you can show around certain kinds of media and who it's being consumed by, in which case it might be relatively easy to show one way or the other. For general signage, it you know, you'd have to find a, ver a location where, somebody some young person's extremely unlikely to to be and and that's possible to imagine such a place um and so in those cases it may be it may ultimately become more like a well is this very likely to be under 15 percent then the control board will have to make a decision did you make a sufficient showing that that likelihood has been met in which case you might effectively get some melded decision making there where there isn't like very clear data that can be demonstrated um, but I, we think it's reasonable to sort of set out this percentage because it will more precisely capture some types of advertising where there is clear data on viewership or listenership or whatever it might be. Um, and for the ones where there may not be quite that much clarity, you're asking them to make a decision saying that very few young people are going to be able to see this. And are you the control board satisfied that they've demonstrated that? And I think that that's within their, will be within their discretion and the court will likely defer to them on that. And so our, our hope is that there won't be a huge amount of litigation as a result of that, of having that line drawn. Thank you. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, David. Um, see if I can articulate my question here in a way that makes sense. Um, does the intent of the advertising, would that have any bearing on how you advertise? In other words, if you're looking to advertise to promote and advocate for increased usage, as opposed to just advertising from a, say, an informative standpoint as to, to where and what you could expect to get, does that make sense as far as the differentiating between the two? Um, yeah, you know, so if you look at section five, actually, the, the definitions do cover this, and it says what an advertisement is in uh, subsection two of section five of uh, the S25 is passed by the Senate, and it defines an advertisement and says any written or verbal statement, illustration, or depiction that is calculated to induce sales of cannabis or cannabis products. Now, it is certainly possible that um, somebody may try to be a little tricky about that and say, well, I was just talking about this thing, but it wasn't calculated to induce sales or there may be genuine, I don't wanna impute bad faith. There may be genuine di disputes about whether a certain statement written or otherwise, or visual, whatever it might be, was calculated to induce sales. That could become a subject of, of dispute, but I think that is a reasonable definition saying advertising is about increasing sales that's its purpose and if you can show that say there was something that was purely informational about um the state of the cannabis market in vermont but not actually talking about any particular establishment or something like that you could say well this is this is just um information about where things are and it's not calculated to induce sales you know there there are um Certainly it's possible under this standard to make statements about what's going on in the market that are not advertising. And we think that that's a reasonable distinction to draw. Okay, very good, thank you. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Right, let me go a little further uh, in where I thought my colleague Rep LeClaire was going. Uh, and the quintessential example, example that I thought he was leading up to is the, um, a tobacco analogy, trying to make sure that uh, what I'll call are modes of uh, impression on different age groups 
uh, the tobacco folks were enjoined from doing, and that's the, the, uh, the use of Joe Camel, the use of sports events, the use of uh, certain media and thematic kinds of contexts, which were uh, clearly tailored to induce young people, legal or not, uh, to pick up tobacco as a habit. And I'm not seeing any kind of constriction on, uh, again, the, the sort of contextual uh, um, uh, package, if you will, within which uh, the verbiage would be located. And I, and I think that's too bad because obviously, uh, I think the advertiser knows, advertisers know, young people respond to some things that older folks do not. Thank you. Yes, Representative, I think that's an important point. I do think if you look at uh, subsection seven under, I should say subdivision seven under section six, it says uh, things are not, you, you, the advertisements are not allowed to contain any statement or illustration that is designed to be or has the effect of being particularly appealing to persons under 21 years of age. I do think that allows the uh, board to make reasonable uh, regulations in that vein of the Joe Camel type of thing you're talking about. Uh, one thing to note with tobacco, just as a broader point to keep in mind, is a lot of the regulations around that were actually as a result of a, the giant court settlement that happened in the 90s with the tobacco companies. So they don't really get to appeal the First Amendment questions anymore as a result of their be hands being tied by that injunction and that, that settlement, I should say. So um, that's a slightly different legal point, but I do think this more substantive point around uh, appeals to young people is addressed in this bill. And Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. David, in jurisdictions like uh, Colorado and Washington, do they land on the uh, 21 year old restriction or is it a, you know, you can join the army at 18 and go throw grenades at people. You ought to be able to look at advertising. Is that a, a justifiable number that has not been challenged in other jurisdictions? I don't believe 21 has been challenged anywhere. Okay. Excellent. Any other questions from committee members? So thank you so much for being with us this morning. I apologize for the delay in getting us started, but, um, uh, but this has been uh, an important uh, dialogue here this morning. And uh, we do appreciate you coming and sharing your perspective um, that, that this appears to be headed in the right direction. Thank you, Madam Chair. So committee, we are going to shift gears now. We have uh, two more folks to give some testimony this morning. So um, Graham, I'm afraid I've only ever heard you say your last name once. So I need you to say it again for me so that I know how to pronounce your last name. Absolutely, it's Graham Unangst Rufinacht. Okay. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, from rural Vermont, and I understand that you have um, some some thoughts and perspectives and ideas on uh, what's in S25. Um, so take it away, and uh, we will try to hold our questions until the end of your presentation. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee, for having myself and the other members of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition here today. Rural Vermont is a member of that coalition and supports everything that was said by the former members of that coalition who, who testified earlier this morning, Mark Hughes and Jeffrey Pizzatillo, and we also support Maddie Kempner's testimony and Joshua Decatur's when he gets around to testifying as well. Um, for those of you who do not know, Rural Vermont uh, is an organization that works through organizing education and advocacy to affect um, agricultural access and equity throughout the state. We've been around for more than 35 years, starting sort of at the beginning of what we're at that point called the farm crises of the 1980s. Um, and I just want to check really quickly, how is my volume? I'm, I, I live in a part of Vermont where we don't have excellent reception, so I am dialing in. If you see my video go out, it's probably because I'm just seeing things slow down a little bit. And I want to keep my connection good. But yep. I'm seeing a nod, but it looks good. We're hearing you just fine. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I guess I'd just like to start, you know, we had a conversation as, as Mark and Jeffrey mentioned with 
uh, Madam Chair and Representative Gannon uh, a couple nights ago. So um, we have some understanding of, of where folks stand and in respect to some of our recommendations. And um, I think in particular related to our, our concerns related to agricultural access and cannabis being considered an agricultural product, um, we understand that there is very little willingness at this point to affect that. Um, however, I think it's important for us to put on record our concerns and our thoughts with respect to that. Um, our position is that outdoor production of cannabis um, is an agricultural act and an agricultural product. Um, we, in 904A, small cultivators, in Act 164, the language states that it is the intent of the General Assembly to move as much of the illegal cannabis market as possible into the regulated market for the purposes of consumer protection and public safety. It is also the intent of the General Assembly to encourage participation in the regulated cannabis market by small local farmers. We also know that in the required agricultural practices, an agricultural product is defined as any raw agricultural commodity that is principally produced on the farm and includes products prepared from the raw agricultural commodities principally produced on the farm. Um, we understand that crops such as alcohol, hemp, for those going towards biofuels are all considered agricultural. The Vermont State Agricultural Strategic Plan that was recently released has multiple briefs about the critical nature of alcohol sales, the production of alcohol ingredients, cultivation of hemp, and more non-food products and related activities to the state of Vermont's agricultural future. Um, we also recognize that the existing local cannabis economy, which was referenced earlier, and much of the small farm economy is dependent on direct sales from small producers to local consumers. Um, when we can find cultivators to selling in the wholesale marketplace, it can find them to being price takers, not price makers. It creates a disproportionate degree of influence, of market influence, uh, and power for cultivators at greater scale of production, for wholesalers, for retailers, for product manufacturers and dispensaries. Um, and I think it's also important just to recognize that we are just advocating that outdoor production be considered um, agricultural. There are significant differences between indoor and outdoor production. They differ substantially in production ability in terms of seasonality, in terms of versus year-round production, in terms of impact with respect to water usage, uh, electrical usage, facilities requirements, uh, visual impact, and more. Um, and just the real importance of the legislature taking the step to differentiate between indoor and outdoor production as uh, our, our coalition member Jeffrey spoke to earlier. Um, so with that, I think some of the pushback we've heard um, when, we, when we begin to speak in this way is that um, we're advocating for the unregulated agricultural sale of cannabis like any other agricultural crop. And I just want to say that that's not true at all. We are advocating for licenses to be required for these folks. Um, if you might look at other agricultural crops like meat and milk and hemp, um, they are strictly regulated um, through testing and otherwise. Um, we also have been told that it's simply illegal. We understand that this is a controlled substance. Those who will be consuming it in Vermont, selling it at point of sale, um, processing it, are all going to be engaging in illegal, illegal, illegal activity at the federal level and will all have the same risks related to civil and criminal uh, asset and forfeiture that we have been um, told to be concerned about for agricultural producers. Um, we have also been told that Enabling more outdoor production might be a greater risk to children and youth, and we want to just adamantly say that, that we see no evidence that agricultural production increases youth access or youth risk. Um, and we would urge you to be very careful at the unintended consequences of moving this industry to more towards an indoor production, which Act 164 absolutely currently does by default. Um, um, Critically important to our work as an organization that represents Farmer Voices is bringing farmers and community members in to testify. As you may know, the agricultural committees have not taken up this bill over the many years, Act 164, S54, S25. S25 is the only bill that briefly went to an agricultural committee in the Senate Agriculture two days before crossover. Um, we have many people, we have hundreds of people who signed up petitions last year around this bill we can bring in people who are cultivators, who are growers, and unfortunately, none of these folks have had the opportunity to influence this bill and what it looks like. There's a substantial lack of um, informing this bill from the direct stakeholders who are going to be hopefully constituting this industry and who are in legislative intent supposed to be constituting this industry. Um, and maybe I'll just, I'll just leave that there for now and move on to what I think, you know, 
are some ways of addressing some of our concerns about how farmers who, for example, have land in current use or in agricultural easements where they will not be allowed to grow this plant, um, how we can address some of those concerns and and perhaps you know, give you some more amenable things that you can work on. Um, so as was said earlier, I think you can focus on directives to the Cannabis Control Board related to equity and access and scale appropriate regulation. You can put things, uh, some of our recommendations, recommendations directly in, but if you feel like that's too detailed, you can also always focus on directives. So one thing that was focused on earlier by Jeffrey was rather than limiting the number of licenses, limiting the scale of operation. This is production caps. We have articulated a tiered um, license structure in our proposals. Um, and then Jeffrey went into that earlier. But the goal here again is to assure that as many people as possible can share in the wealth of this industry. We don't have the kind of consolidation that um, Representative Anthony was expressing concerns about and that you can have more of a distributed small business um, industry. Um, the outdoor to indoor ratio is also critical. Jeffrey spoke to this as well. Um, for every 1,000 square feet of indoor production, we would like to see 4,000 square feet of outdoor production. That's a one to four ratio. And the reason for that, again, is simply to achieve equity between these types of growing. We have seasonality versus year-round production. You have the impact from water usage, from electricity usage, et cetera, versus the sunlight that is growing plants and water that farmers can use um, through drip, drip irrigation or otherwise. Um, we also recognize just the simple cost barriers to establishing indoor cultivation, as opposed to what many small farmers are doing. And we are very unique in New England, um, for those of you who might know more about the national and global agricultural scene. But we still, you know, we, we do have a lot of opportunities for small scale specialty crop producers. And by specialty crops, I mean vegetables, fruits, et cetera, which I sort of see cannabis and hemp falling into the categories of. Um, currently, the hemp program also differentiates between indoor and outdoor production. Um, so we have the ability here to sort of, at this point, before federal law has legalized this, to create a model economy, which is equitable, that ends at the state boundaries. What we're suggesting are market control mechanisms, like limiting the scale of operation, like uh, articulating the indoor to outdoor ratio, um, which will hopefully create a more equitable market, will prevent um, folks with um, more capital than others, folks with established wealth from dominating the market and allow folks in Vermont to participate equitably. Um, given that we have these barriers still related to land and agricultural easements, land and current use, um, agricultural grant programs, et cetera, um, I would also urge the committee to do what it can to maybe consider language to specifically address that. For example, if we know that farmers will have to take land out of current use or agricultural easement, to engage in growing this crop, um, it is possible potentially to put into this bill language which would say that they would incur no penalty for dropping that land out of current use or out of agricultural easements. Um, currently, there would be financial penalties for both. Um, we also have concerns um, about the current allowances for home, home scale production. That's the home grow allowance, which is too mature and for immature plants. I was on the phone with a, a Vermont-based food safety compliance worker the other day who travels around the country. And he was speaking to some of the real challenges simply of being in compliance at the home scale with this level. Even with market, even with normal garden vegetables, tomatoes, et cetera, you know, you're growing um, a number that you know aren't gonna make it to the end. You have seed viability issues. You have, you know, just poor plant genetics that play out in that particular plant. And with this plant in particular, if you're starting from seed, you have male to female ratios to consider if anyone wants to do any home scale breeding, et cetera, um, this is sort of directing people to purchasing clones to not addressing um, genetic legacy, um, the potential for people to engage in genetic appropriate um, development for our region. Um, and it's really directing them towards the people who are gonna be providing those clones um, and a lot less independent on their part. Um, he also expressed simply concerns with um, the quality of product from home growers where people feel like they really have to hold on to what they have. Uh, he expressed concerns seeing a lot of local product over the years where it's just moldy or et cetera, because people simply feel that this is valuable. They don't necessarily know what they're doing or looking at and the importance of having outreach, of having folks who are available to teach people as opposed to simply come and punish and criminalize people, rather than have outreach to ensure that there is safe production happening at the local level, um, whether that's for home grow or commercial use. Um, 
And again, I just want to touch on our craft license structure that Jeffrey mentioned. Um, we can give you more information about that. If you already don't have our proposals and notes, um, hopefully you do. Um, and again, just thinking about direct markets. I am a small producer. I sell grass-fed beef. Um, small producers rely on direct markets. Based on the current paradigm that's set up in Act 164, a cultivator will have to buy a separate retail license to be able to market their product. And there's no differentiation between scale at this point. Um, and what we are advocating in our craft license category, the category of license where small outdoor producers, the smallest scale, can have a vertically integrated license, similar to the opposite end for the dispensaries, um, where th these smaller producers can process on site, can, sale, can sell a uh, product from their farm or from their cultivation site directly to consumers so that they can actually achieve a price point which allows them to be a viable business. Um, and I'd love to take comments on this, um, but I also understand that Maddie Kempner from Northeast Organic Farming Association uh, and our coalition member is going to speak, be speaking next. Um, and I will perhaps just hand over my time for her and take questions either from you all now or at the end of all of our testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Graham. And since I don't see folks uh, jumping in to raise their hand, I think we'll hold questions until the end. Um, so welcome, Maddie Kempner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Maddie Kempner, and I'm the policy director at the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Vermont. Uh, for those who may not be as familiar with NOFA, our mission is really centered on building an economically viable, ecologically sound, and socially just agricultural system for Vermont. And that's the spirit in which I come before you today um, to make some recommendations and comments on S25. So as you've heard, NOFA Vermont is also part of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition, um, along with the other folks that you've heard from this morning. And I thought I would just share, since you've heard you know, a lot of detailed testimony from my um, coalition partners about different aspects of the bill that we would like to see changed, I'd love to just bring us back to the vision uh, that, that our coalition has for what this market can look like. Um, so to take a, a sort of broader view, I guess, what we would really love to see in the emerging adult use cannabis marketplace is a market that is reparative of past and current harms of not only cannabis prohibition, but the economic disenfranchisement of the black community in particular, as well as low income um, communities here in our state. We are seeking a market that is accessible at all points in the supply chain from cultivation to retail, um, to diverse communities across racial and economic stratifications to be able to be a part of that market. We are seeking a market that is supportive of small scale, high quality production. Um, and from an agricultural perspective, I just wanna emphasize since you know, that's really our organization's expertise, small scale and high quality is what Vermont is good at. Uh, we you know, we feel right now that Act 164 in many ways sets us up for a consolidated commodity-based marketplace through its licensing structure and the lack of differenti differentiation between uh, indoor and outdoor cultivation, um, as my coalition partners have mentioned. And we really don't want to set up a cannabis marketplace that is headed in the same direction um, of our dairy farms, which you, I'm sure you all know, um, our, our dairy farming industry here in Vermont has become increasingly consolidated. We have seen farm closures, you know, increase rapidly since the 1970s. Um, and that marketplace has become increasingly focused on commodity production and is inaccessible to smaller scale producers and those who are trying to enter that industry for the first time. Um, and just personally, I see, you know, a lot of potential uh, analogy between the direction that our dairy farming industry has taken over these past many decades um, and the way that this the current you know, existing statute around cannabis sets up this marketplace um, for that same fate. And, and I'll also share, I'm sure many of you are aware, um, having been in the legislature, that the legislature has over the years put funding and effort into studying the creation of a Vermont brand for dairy products as a solution and a response to that increasing consolidation and commodification. Uh, and the goal of that, you know, a Vermont brand would really be to differentiate ourselves in the market and align our producers and our products in the minds of consumers with the higher quality that our farms can and do produce. So that's all to say, we are urging you to make some of the changes that we're recommending in order to set up this emerging adult use cannabis marketplace um, in a better direction and to save us from the trajectory that we've seen our dairy farms take 
tragically, I will add, um, and to truly capitalize on Vermont's propensity toward land stewardship, small scale, high quality production and distributed economic opportunity. Um, I also want to reference that and, and just remind you all that the governor included some of the specific points for which we are calling as a coalition in his non-signing letter last year. Um, he particularly called out in that letter that of primary concern is the licensing construct, which will disproportionately benefit Vermont's existing medical dispensaries by giving them sole access to integrated licenses and an unfair head start on market access. He particularly called on the legislature to do the following, uh, which align very well with some of the testimony you've heard, uh, especially from Mark Hughes this morning. He called on the legislature to create a social equity applicant category for cannabis establishment licenses, a 50% licensing fee waiver for those applicants, and additional technical and financial supports, all of which are included in the policy that Mark referenced, um, H414, which is on your, on your committee's wall, so to speak. Um, and finally, he called on the legislature to, uh, in the event that the current integrated licensing structure is maintained, to direct revenues from those licensees to benefit social equity applicants and the communities historic, historically most negatively impacted by cannabis enforcement. So um, I think what I'll do to wrap up, um, I would love to just leave you with you know, some final points and just reiterate again, because my coalition partners have really covered it so well, at a minimum, um, our coalition is asking you to, you know, again, many of these points from the governor's non-signing letters and that you've heard from us this morning, include a so social, excuse me, social equity program in S25 as laid out in H414, including reduced licensees for social equity applicants, establish a cannabis business development fund and, and a, social, a community social equity program. We are asking you to include a craft licensing structure for cannabis businesses in the statute. And we are asking you to differentiate between indoor and outdoor production and set tiered production caps at a one to four ratio between indoor and outdoor. Um, and we feel that all of these provisions on the whole will set us up for a much more equitable, accessible marketplace that steers away from corporate consolidation and commodification. Um, and that really will allow you know, our, our constituencies and diverse communities in Vermont to thrive in this emerging marketplace, um, which I will also just add, you know, represents such a huge opportunity for our farmers and agricultural producers and other types of businesses that are struggling um, currently in our state. And I think that there is so much excitement in our communities for what this marketplace could represent if it were rolled out in a way that was accessible. Um, and we are particularly asking you to make some of these changes, to codify some of these changes in statute and not leave it up to um, the Cannabis Control Board to make all of these decisions because we really need some of these aspects to be included as, found, as foundational um, to the way that this marketplace is being set up and we can't wait for them to, be, to happen potentially later on through rulemaking. And I'm happy to take any questions, thank you. Thank you uh, to both of you for being with us this morning. Um, committee members, do any of you have any questions um, either for Graham or for Maddie? Representative Gannon. Thank you. Um, I think this question is for Maddie. Uh, what do you consider small scale? So uh, we have requested, you know, I think our, our, the production caps could be a good guide that we're recommending. Um, we're recommending that you set production caps. I think that Jeffrey maybe mentioned this earlier at 1,000 square feet for indoor cultivation, um, for at 2,000 square feet for mixed light, and at 4,000 square feet for outdoor cultivation. Um, and we have also recommended that um, anything up to one acre be allowed to be considered agricultural use. Can I quickly also just follow up on that? Um, just to clarify what Maddie was saying, because um, your, your question could be interpreted in a couple of ways, um, Representative Gannon. One is like, what do we mean by small scale agricultural in general? And what are we articulating as the smallest scale license that we'd like to see? And as Maddie said, that small scale license that the, our legislature has already articulated at 1,000 square feet, we would like to see that interpreted as that is the minimal for indoor, it would be up to 4,000 outdoor. And the maximum license, which we still feel is is relatively small, especially when you think about commodity crop production, would be 10,000 square feet of indoor production and 40,000 or approximately one acre of outdoor production. And um, 
A second question, if we were to contemplate a integrated license for, for small scale production, um, would, would you agree that all the protections that are built into um, Act 164 should apply um, to that small scale integrated license? Can you say more about the particular pr um, protections that you're referring to? And one of the things that deeply concerned me in your paper was that, for example, outdoor cultivation did not be need to be enclosed in, in a lock enclosure. Um, one of the, the, the principal points of Act 164 is consumer protection and spe specifically youth protection. And, and I, I just find it unacceptable that, um, that a field of cannabis could be out there with no, no protection at all um, about it, or it's up to the farmer to determine what level of protection there should be. Um, that, that just, I just don't understand that because the, the, this is a consumer protection law. Well, I would, I would just add, you know, on the one hand, I think it's really important to remember that um, producers themselves have an interest both from a liability standpoint, a safety standpoint, and an economic standpoint um, to protect their crops. Um, so I don't think that we are advocating that producers um, wouldn't necessarily, you know, wouldn't do anything to protect their crop and to ensure, you know, that folks can't can't access it. Um, so that's one thing. You know, I also think, um, yeah, I, I think that that's. Um, and important to keep in mind, and I, I but I don't think that um, I don't think that it's appropriate to use the same phrasing. I suppose also to refer to outdoor cultivation as we would for indoor cultivation. I think that the terminology and the um, phrasing could even be changed to make it more flexible because an enclosed lock facility, um, in my mind, is an indoor cultivation scenario. Um, so I think that the language could be changed to allow for outdoor cultivation, um, you know, with more appropriate language, I guess, uh, in reference to, to security for outdoor producers. And if I may just add on to that, um, we actually had a conversation with the president of the Humboldt County Growers Alliance earlier this week. Um, and he spoke to how, you know, these security measures are actually um, barriers to access in some cases, depending on how they're articulated. And like Maddie said, having the same security parameters articulated for indoor operations and outdoor operations, um, just from a logistical standpoint, uh, for small production outside is, is, is challenging. Um, I think also the concern around uh, hidden from public view can be very challenging depending on the actual piece of land people have access to. Um, and it's and I think one thing that should be thought about is, and I'm curious, is what is the path? So it sounds like the scenario that you're bringing up, Representative Gannon, is that a youth would see a, a crop and would go and um, find a time to, to take it or steal it. And, and that would be, uh, they would ultimately find a way to use it. And I think part of the question I would have is, what, is, what does that path actually look like? Because we know that to get to a, at least a smokable product, you're talking about harvesting it at the appropriate time. You're talking about finding a place where you can dry a very smelly plant material for a period of time. Um, you're talking about a lot of know-how along that way as well. So both, you know, what Maddie says stands in terms of, I think farmers want to find ways to protect their crop, not only for the public good, but for their own personal welfare. Um, and there's, there's certainly reason to articulate appropriate uh, security requirements for outdoor production, um, but also I'm just curious as to what that path for that risk is that, that you're seeing there. Like, what, what does that look like from your perspective for the, the youth risk there? I believe we have Representative Anthony with a question. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you both for uh, your testimony. I'm wondering if the uh, small scale integrative license <clears throat> would include on, on farm sales, <clears throat> you know, farm stand type of operation, um, having through hours of discussions about raw milk, I figured, well, you know, if you're going to have small scale, um, uh, if you will, on farm cultivation, and in fact, an integrated license, uh, and create a craft dope, 
uh, why why would it not also uh, include a farm stand? Or is that not is that is that asking for uh, sort of another another argument that you don't want to have? Um, um, thank you for that question, Representative Anthony. And I would say, um, in our minds, absolutely. Um, I think that we envision a, a small scale or craft integrated license to include on farm sales. And I think, you know, Graham touched on this in, in his testimony, and I'm sure could touch on it more, but that just on farm direct to consumer sales is so, so integral um, to how to, to the the marketing, you know, that allow so many of our small scale diversified producers to thrive um, in any production type right now. And it, it was really exciting this year to see the legislature expand um, sales of, of raw milk, for example, as you alluded to, to farm stands and CSAs. And we would love to see a similar model with um, craft cannabis and do feel that that could be done um, in a way that is, that is safe. And that really, again, is foundational to allowing producers to thrive and be able to access this market. Uh, thanks. Just one follow-up observation and query. I'm kind of surprised that the uh, House Committee on Agriculture has not um, been actively encouraging you to come make an appearance and talk about this because generally my, my experience is they've treated uh, uh, agricultural activities as very, very much uh, 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 a, um, a responsibility that not only they're proud of, but they covet. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that you, you, you haven't had a, a day or so, because they're the experts at tailoring, uh, you know, all the safety factors, the environmental farming, security issues that Rep Gannon referred to. Uh, that's what they do uh, for farmers. Um, so I'm disappointed to hear, but I'm not sure I'm hearing the whole story as to how or why you haven't been able to spend a day uh, in their committee and, and sort of let them vet it and let them figure out uh, kind of the aspects that I, I know very little about, quite frankly, um, except what I hear say. Uh, so uh, I'm, I hope you do get a chance to, to make your pitch and for them to have input on this. Uh, and I'm kind of surprised that they haven't, they haven't jumped at it. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate you saying that, Representative Anthony. And I, um, you know, there were senators, especially in Senate government ops, who did help, were helpful getting us into Senate agriculture. But we have been, um, it's been very challenging to get into House agriculture. And by the time we did get into Senate agriculture, it was two days before crossover. So they felt very limited. But you should be assured that we have been um, asking for that time for a number of months now, even since prior to the session. And just to, to quickly follow up on, on Maddie's response to direct sales, I think the main point is. Yes, direct sales, but that's not to say that we're saying direct sales of cannabis would look like direct sales of tomatoes from our farm stand. Absolutely, like you said, the agricultural community would be a great place to look at what security would look like, what precautions would look like, what a model for um, CSA distribution or pickup, et cetera, could look like from a direct sale on farm environment. Yeah, and I would just add to that as well. I appreciate the question and I, and I would just ask that, you know, um, Anything that you can do, Madam Chair, to to get this bill referred to House Agriculture would be really beneficial. I mean, we have been asking since last year um, to get our constituents' voices heard in both of the agricultural agri agricultural committees um, on this issue, and would really welcome that opportunity in House Ag. We have been able to get a few folks in to testify um, during a series of events we hosted called Small Farm Action Days um, over the past few months between NOFA and Rural Vermont, who were able to, um, to speak to some of these issues. But I agree with you that I think the agriculture committees um, really are the place for us to bring many of these concerns. And we would love the opportunity to bring forward just so many more voices that we ourselves um, are not able to directly represent um, who can speak to their own experience with this. Thank you both for being with us this morning. Um, I don't see any other committee questions. I do wanna just level set on how uh, the legislative process works. The Speaker of the House decides which policy committee is going to be referred a bill. And each chair of each committee uh, has the ability to, uh, you know, to ask for an opportunity to weigh in on something or take testimony on anything at any time. And so I am not going to second guess either the Speaker's wisdom or the wisdom of the chair of the House Agriculture Committee on this. 
I'm sure that they will reach out to us if they feel they need to uh, to have some uh, changes made to the bill. So um, committee, we are at noon. Um, and so thank you for your patience with our uh, issues getting connected to YouTube this morning and certainly hope that when we come back after the floor, um, we can get right started. There will be an opportunity for some more testimony this afternoon and then, um, and then hopefully an opportunity for some uh, committee discussion at the end of the day. Um, so appreciate your hard work and attention to the details of this bill and I'll see you all on the floor.